All right, welcome to the screencast for Chapter 15, or Topic D, uh, Section 4, where they talk about the depressants. Depressants and stimulants are often uh, discussed together because they both affect the CNS, or the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. The depressants tend to depress your central nervous system functions, whereas your as stimulants tend to stimulate it, so they're um, aptly named. So depressants interfere with brain cell communication by altering the concentration of or the activity of what are called neurotransmitters, which is how brain cells talk with one another. They cause a depression decrease in brain activity, which affects the rest of the body since the brain runs the whole body. So things like heart rate and breathing rate will also be affected. Um, this is not the same. De depressants depress the CNS. This is not the same thing as the mental health condition known as depression. Depression is, you know, uh, a mental health issue where people are feeling down, you know, their feelings are depressed, they're not feeling good about themselves. And ironically, many depressants are actually used to de treat depression. And in that case, they're medically known as antidepressants because they help people get out of their depression. So if that's not confusing enough. Depressants are used to treat depression, and then they're called antidepressants. They include tranquilizers, sedatives, and hypnotics. And those just all sound like things that would mellow you out. And in a low to moderate dose, the main symptoms or the main uh, actions, the most, the main effects you have from it, short-term effects, are calmness, a decrease in anxiety, and relaxed muscles. If you have too high a dose, up to a lethal dose, you're going to start seeing slurred speech, a staggering gait, altered perception, sleep-induced coma, or even possible death. So ethanol, which is the alcohol we can drink, think about, you know, someone who has drank a little versus somebody who has drank a lot. You'll probably have to, you know, go on YouTube to see examples of this since none of you are 21 yet. Uh, most depressants develop both tolerance and dependence, which is what makes them dangerous. So you need more and more, and you uh, have physical withdrawal symptoms if you don't continue to have more and more of them. Ethanol is the most widely used depressant and psychoactive drug. It's legal in most countries. It's been around since ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago. It occurs naturally with many fruits and plants as uh they finish ripening and start moving toward decomposing. That's just part of their natural decay process. The concentration of ethanol can be increased through distillation. Distillation is just like it's been in chemistry, you know, all along. You're separating things by their boiling point, and what you do is you separate the ethanol from the water, and then that's what we know as hard liquor, things like whiskey, vodka, whatever. It's used in alcoholic drinks, but it's also used as an antiseptic before an injection. That's usually rubbing alcohol. It also dries out skin, so it can be used on the feet to prevent blisters. It has a beneficial effect on circulation, and it diminishes heart disease in low doses. And that, of course, uh, is not rubbing alcohol to improve your circulation. But, you know, when they talk about having a glass of red wine a night, that's what they're talking about there. Chronic consumption of large amounts of ethanol has both short-term and long-term effects and is a major source of social and psychological or physiological problems. So IB uh, takes a world view of it that ethanol is, you know, the most consumed depressant out there, but it also probably creates more uh, issues for society than any other food or drink that people tend to um, partake of. Metabolism of ethanol, it's C2H5OH, so it's polar, at least it's got a polar end. So it dissolves in water, but because it also has a nonpolar end, it dissolves in lipids or fats. And this is why alcohol is a quick time between ingestion and the onset of effects, because it get in, gets into your blood and circulates quickly. And also because it's got that nonpolar end, it's able to cross over the blood-brain barrier and... Um, create symptoms or side effects up there as well. Alcohol is also one of those synergistic drugs. Synergistic means that it adds its energy or it adds its effect to other things going on. And um, so if you've taken a drug to help you sleeping, that alcohol will make you sleep even more. So it has a pen potential to increase the effect of any other medication you're taking. And that would include both the therapeutic effect and any side effects of that other drug.
So examples of the synergy that alcohol tends to have with aspirin, it'll tend to increase stomach bleeding. With other depressants, it can put you into heavy sedation or a coma. With tobacco, it increases your risk of cancers, especially stomach cancer. And with many drugs, it interferes with their metabolism in the liver, which could cause greater and more prolonged effects as well as liver damage. Many prescriptions will indicate right on them they should be taken with alcohol because besides the synergy, um, the alcohol will tend to interfere with the body's metabolism of the drug. So you can not only have synergy um, with some of the effects of the drug, but it can also interfere with how much the drug gets into your system and how effective it is. So it could go either way with alcohol. Distillation of alcohol, or detection of alcohol, I'm sorry. Detection of alcohol, because most countries have a limit on the amount of alcohol you can have in your system and still operate a vehicle, the law enforcement has to have a way to detect it, and an easy way along the roadside is crucial. The upper limit in Minnesota is 80 milligrams per 100 cc's or 100 grams of blood, so 0.08%. And the analysis of ethanol in your system can be done with your breath, your blood, or your urine. And the most um, accurate is going to be either to use your blood or your urine, but your breath is what's typically done by the roadside um, to get a baseline and decide if they're going to do a more precise test. So three types of detectors uh, that can be used along the roadside. By far, the breathalyzer is the number one used one, at least in the United States. It uses a chemical reaction involving alcohol that produces a color change from orange to green. Chromium-6 becomes chromium-3. This should sound familiar because this is exactly what we looked at in Topic 10 Organic Chemistry, that alcohols can easily be oxidized into an aldehyde or a ketone, depending upon whether it's a primary or secondary. Ethanol, having just two carbons, would be a primary alcohol. So um, the breathalyzer will allow it to be oxidized and the chromium therefore reduced, and you see the color change. An intoxilizer is similar. You breathe into it, but now it detects alcohol by infrared spectroscopy, and it's based on the absorption spectra of the CH bonds. And with an OH in there, of course, that replaces one CH bond in the ethanol. So um, they look to see, they just look up the absorption spectra, and it gives them an automatic readout how that correlates to the percentage of alcohol in there. The problem is that diabetics can also register on this because diabetics tend to have more than the average person has more ketones in their body than the average person because their body's inability to always process sugar properly and so they don't always break things down the same way as the rest of us. And then the last one is the Elko sensor or the Elko sensor 3. It detects a chemical reaction of alcohol in a fuel cell and measures the energy release. So that OH bond again is going to release a different amount of energy than if there wasn't OH or alcohol in there and it converts it to an electric voltage. The one you've probably heard of is the breathalyzer. By far, it's the most uh, commonly used by law enforcement. One thing they all have in common is they all require a mouthpiece and for you to breathe into it, and so it's the analysis that varies. The breathalyzer is the least accurate, but it's the most easy to use along the roadside. So many states use this as a preliminary test, and then they might use one of the other um, breathing detectors, or more often they're going to have a blood draw or a urine sample to determine what your um, legal limit is if you're over it or not. Using blood and urine are the most established and accurate methods. Um, they use liquid chromatography. It must be done in a lab, and of course it requires either a blood or urine sample. And it vaporizes the liquid over gas, so it's gas chromatography basically. And it um, leaves a column at a different time, you know, the different things settle out, just like when we did paper chromatography with different colors, different colors move across the paper at different speeds, same type of thing here, and then that's analyzed to determine the amount of alcohol. Other depressants, other big categories are the benzodiazepines. It's another major group of depressants. They depress the part of the brain that controls emotion. So it's used for anxiety disorder. It's also used as muscle relaxants and sleeping pills. And they tend to have few side effects, but they can cause dependence. So um, if you're using these to relax or to sleep, soon you'll get to the point that you can't relax on your own. So that is one reason to be careful about prescribing and using them on a daily basis. The two most widely used 
benzodiazepines are one called Valium. It's just diazepam. And then the nitro, nitrozepam is something called Mogadon. Valium is probably the one you've heard of. If we look at the structure down here, they both contain the benzene ring and then the diazepine is this five carbon ring here. So if I, um, let me just grab my marker here, scroll back down to it. Hopefully you can see the diazepine here. Prozac is the other one. And we're gonna look at the difference here. So here's the diazepine ring. It's got the four carbons and the two nitrogens within that ring. And so here's the diazepine on here. But over here, the diazepine ring has been altered and it looks a little bit different, which makes Prozac um, a different kind of medication than the Valium or the Mogadon. And so moving on to the next slide here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about these. So the benzodiazepines, looking at their structure on the previous slide, are gonna be largely nonpolar, which means they get into the brain and have effects on the brain. So another widely used antidepressant is the third one that was shown there, the floxetine hydrochloride, or what's commonly known as Prozac. And because it's not as polar, it has the two benzene rings, but not the diazepine ring, it actually works by increasing levels of serotonin, which is the happy neurotransmitter. It's the feel good uh, chemical. So it doesn't actually depress the CNS. So it's not, it doesn't really belong in the category of the depressants, but it was discovered by monitoring or uh, modifying, I should say, the benzodiazepines into something that has the same good effects that we want, but not as many of the side effects. And so it's also used for eating and panic disorders, and it's probably the most prescribed antidepressant out there right now, just because it's so safe. If if um, your issue isn't true clinical depression, and it's not truly caused by a chemical imbalance, you're not gonna see any results with it, but you're not gonna see harmful side effects either. And that pretty much uh, concludes what the book has to tell you about depressants in section D4.